So, herzlich willkommen. Äh, heute bin ich hier. Ich bin ein neues Gesicht, ähm, aber ihr seid immer noch bei 99 zu 1. Ich bin Lea und werde ab jetzt auch ähm, regelmäßig Folgen hier machen. Ähm, vielleicht kennt ihr mich auch aus einer Folge. Ich habe eine Folge ähm, gemacht zur Polizei. Genau, ist aber schon ein bisschen länger hier. Und die Folge heute wird auf Englisch sein, so I'm going to switch to English right now. Um, today we are going to talk about um, capitalism and criminal law and how criminal law is connected to capitalism. And I'm really happy uh, that today Valeria Wegweis is joining us. Um, She is um, Argentinian and German, and she teaches criminology and transitional justice at Buenos Aires University and at National Kilmes University in Argentina. Um, she is currently a research fellow at the University of Constance, and she is an associate researcher at the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History. And she had held different scholarships, including the Fulbright and the Alexander from Humboldt scholarship. And her first book, um, which is the one which we are mainly going to talk um, about today, is this one here. I don't know if you can see it very good. It's Marxism and Criminology. And it talks about what I just said about criminal law and how it is connected to capitalism. And it won um, the, the Choice Award by the American Library Association and also the Outstanding Book Award by the Academy of Criminal Justice Science. Um, she also authored two other books. Um, one of them is Bienvenidos a Lawfare. And um, she published another book in December, I think, right? Yeah. In December, which is called Criminalization of Activism. Yeah. And last year, in 2021, she was awarded the American Society of Criminology um, Award for Critical Criminology. Yeah. Did I forget anything to mention anything? Yeah. It's really nice to see you without a jacket and to know that it's warm where you are. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I would uh, say let's start. And I would like to start very basic today with a definition of crime. Um, so when we think about crime, I think the common and typical image that comes up is um, a murderer or like the typical criminal is a murderer or a robber or a rapist or a thief and especially a person who breaks the law. And I wanted to ask you whether you can elaborate what you think is problematic um, um, with this definition and also with the, def uh, with the picture we have um, of the typical criminal and also how this is linked to a bourgeois definition of criminality. Thank you very much, Lea. That's a, a really an absolute great question because I have been teaching criminology in Argentina since um, 2009, so <laughs> for a few <laughs> years. And um, each time that I open a course, I first ask the students to draw a criminal. And then I ask them to do the same at the end of the course. And that's exactly what you are pointing out. So in the beginning, it's always a guy with a gun like pointing out to someone else to get some cell phone and handy. And at the end, I get them to try to draw, even though it's complex, some international crime, corporate crime, transnational crime, so more complex um, offenses. But in the beginning, as you say, it's usually um, the image of a murder. And indeed, even the, the picture of a murder is misleading because if we see the prison population worldwide from Germany to Argentina, we will see that murderers are really very few. Even within the over-criminalized population, so the poor, the immigrants, the young, the impoverished that are in prison, most of them are more for uh, property crimes. 
In Germany, we even have prison for debts that it was suspended only in the context of the COVID pandemic. So indeed, it's not even the murderer that we could say, okay, even if it's street crime, it's a very severe offense, but most of the people are there for robberies and without any violence, even for like picking a cell phone, a handy e on the subway, on the Uban. So really like the, like the, the, the image that we have of the criminal is pretty misleading. So we don't have murderers or rapists uh, populating the prisons, and we have mostly very, very pity uh, criminals. And if we go even beyond this street crime, so even beyond the murderer, and we try to see a broader picture, we can like point out that indeed only in the 20th century, so only in the last century, 75 million people were killed, but not on the streets, not on passionate crimes, but in wars, dictatorships, civil conflicts. So most of the crimes are not even committed by individuals taking the decision by themselves, but by states and, and international organizations or uh, armed groups that are fighting in massive violence context. So when we are focusing on crimes and like really thinking in the, in the individual murderer, we are really missing the point. Yeah. Most of the suffering that is happening worldwide is produced by states and corporations. Most of the people that died every day for causes that could be prevented can be attributed to states and great corporations, even if we think in the context of the pandemic. So this is a, an alert for all of us to try to change this image that we have about what is crime and take into account that if we have street crimes, we have property crimes and murder, and even murder is very, very, very little of the people that are actually criminalized. But even we need to go beyond that image and pay attention to the fact that massive suffering is not caused by individuals at any possible level, murder, property, rape, sexual crime, but indeed by states and corporations acting massively and causing really uh, extreme and systematic suffering since the beginning of humanity. And if we, if on top of that, we, we add financial crimes, we ask, we add colonialism, neo-colonialism, we, we, we will really figure out that those are the real crime and like yeah. that if we need to talk about impunity in Germany, we will better talk about the Brandenburg airport, we will better talk about Namibians that are still waiting for reparations and not about uh, being stolen the handy in the oven. Yeah, yeah. So you already answered a part of the next question I had because we just talked about like what is problematic about the bourgeois definition, which is saying that only robbers and murderers are criminals. You already explained a bit what we should also or who we should also consider to be criminal. So um, I wanted to ask you, are there any other approaches to crime? You, you already explained a little bit to it, but can we define crime in another way then if we don't use the bourgeois definition? Totally. So indeed there we can, we can learn from the abolitionist perspective that was mostly developed in the Nordic countries but we also have some experiences in, in Germany. For example, we have Sebastian Scherer from Hamburg University, eh, or we were talking um, about like many scholars from the 1960s. And all of them tried to say that when we talk about crime, our mind, the same things that we were talking about, mind settings. We say crime and then we immediately think about police, imprisonment, eh, criminalization, judges, criminal justice system. So maybe we should stop talking about crime and try to phrase things differently. So from this perspective, they think it, the same that, that the discussion that we are having now uh, about gender. We will not change gender inequality, saying student in, but it can call uh, our attention to the fact that we have been using the masculine for 100 years. So. Of course, like language will not change inequality in at a material level, but it can like send some message. So mm -hmm. they say that, and in this regard, they say let's stop talking about crime and let's um, talk about uh, negative social behaviors, 
social harms, uh, conflict situations. Mm -hmm. So everything that can call to and like relate to other kind of solutions outside the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And we had a husband that is a, a that he was an, an abolitionist from from the Nordic countries. He said, "Imagine that you live with with uh, you live in a vegue with another four friends, and once like a guy, one of the guys or one of the girls comes like totally mad, and um, starts breaking the the TV in the in the in the living. So you're there in the von Zimmer and like the the TVs." Random, randomly destroyed, and you have been living in that vege for three years. Will you call the police? Because that's at, that's actual damage. You could call the yeah. police, right? Like the guy or the girl have just broken private property, and they have they, he or she has used violence. So there could be a criminal offense. But you know that person. You have been cooking together, sharing the bathroom. Uh, cleaning dishes, you will not call the police. You will think about other solutions. You will not think that about that in terms of crime. And that opens a lot of possibilities. You will tell that person, hey, now you need to buy another TV. Or hey, you totally need to call to TECA like right now and get a therapist. Like you cannot have this rupture of violence. Or, okay, you don't have money? Okay, what about restorative justice? You will have to clean the dishes for the rest of the month. Or let's just talk. Let's just have a conversation in the VG to know how we can prevent these kind of situations because that was really insane what has just happened. So he calls attention to the fact that if we, if with our relatives, if with our, our friends, with our VG, we will never dare to call the police we will really wait for a very extreme situation to call the police. And the solution will be way better because imagine if we were, if we call the police, our our colleague will be in prison. We will not have the TV. We will we will have to go there and like testify in front of a court. It's like it's a mess yeah. and it doesn't yeah. bring totally. any solution. Yeah. Exactly. Like really, it's not it's not a proper yeah. solution. Yeah. And the other way yeah. we can sorry? I also don't think that it's the best solution to solve exactly. problems because most of the times um, it often intensif and intensifies the problems. I have the feeling, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, like the the, um, the these criminologists say, if we are, if we don't do that to our to the people that we love, and indeed the solutions are better when we think outside the criminal justice system and we don't think about crime but about a conflict situation. Why we don't do that? in the rest of the situations of our life. And then we will have a broader perspective. And this is not only for murder or property damage or, or robbery or whatever. It's also for corporate crime, because I don't want the Ministry of, of Transport to be jailed because of the 11 years delay of the Brandenburg Airport. I want that money back mm. so that we can use that for welfare expenditures. Yeah. I don't want like the Ministry of Justice in jail because the poor conditions in the asylum seeker centers. I want that. I want money there to improve those conditions. I want better human rights regulations to improve the situations on those centers. So the prison system and the, the criminal response is not good, not neither for the ordinary crimes nor for the crimes of the powerful. And stop thinking about crime and thinking about conflict, so conflict situations, social harm might allow us to broaden up our creativity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think this uh, really was a central point also for my understanding to not only see it as crime, but to consider crime as social harm or um, harmful behavior. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we talked about the definition of crime and how we think it's not uh, the proper definition, but still uh, the bourgeois definition exists and I wondered and I wanted to ask you what purpose do you think it serves as it exists and how criminalization is used and can be used in a capitalist society yeah and you also talk about this in your book which I found really interesting um, yeah thank you so, um, yeah, unfortunately, we don't talk about social harm, we talk about crime. 
and the bourgeois law is the main rule, as you said. Um, and it serves, of course, some functional purposes, um, as we were saying, like like the if we if we think about today, we can see that Afghanistan could see could be seen as a criminal criminal criminogenic situation, but uh, the fact that the criminal justice system is thought and enforced. Uh, under the bourgeois regulations means that that is outside the criminal justice system, the domestic and the international one. The same with the situation in Syria, the same with external debt in impoverished countries. And so indeed like this, um, this image that we have about murder and robbery as the main crimes that we need to pay attention to is very functional to the continued reproduction of the criminal justice system. Um, indeed, like your question made me think about uh, this movie that is on Netflix now and that everybody's talking about is Don't Look Up. I didn't see it. <laughs> Until now, I didn't see it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no it's, not, it's not the best movie of your life. But, <laughs> but for me, it was like a, um, it was a, um, a little bit a, like a, a brainstorm because it shows like uh, that, that the world can be destroyed from one second to the other one, and business continues as usual. And that's a little bit what we are uh, suffering today in the pandemic. Yeah. Because if you course. think about, yeah, right? Totally, because if we think totally. about First World and Second World War, terrible events, but they were in Europe. Um, the anti-slavery yeah. war, it was in the United States. Independence mm -hmm. war, they were in Africa dictatorships in Argentina, in Latin America, in Asia. But now we are in, like confronting an, uh, a global threat. That's something that hasn't happened in, in a lot of, in a, in a very long time. And nevertheless, instead of like saying, okay, we need to pay attention to what is the source of this. And the source of this is clearly corporate crime, how we produce the meat, how we treat our, our, um, our food, our, um, our commercial system worldwide, how we treat the environment, the, um, the situation of the, of the ecosystem worldwide. So behind this pandemic, we see a lot of like um, uh, climate change, a lot of things that behind has stayed corporate crime. So instead of saying, okay, we are in confronting a global threat, that behind that underlying it, there is a lot of state corporate crime. Let's like stop altogether, stop things as they are going on, and let's focus on how to change the world in order to prevent a catastrophe. No, we are continuing doing business as usual, paying attention to Lady Gaga's new album, uh, buying a McDonald's, uh, trying to save money for a new iPhone. So it's crazy that and that's why I related to this movie that is not good at all, but just like it's a call of attention to the fact that if not even a global pandemic is like really like calling our attention to the fact that the real crimes are the ones that are putting humanity at threat and we continue doing a business as usual, we are in trouble. And they are like the criminal selectivity and the inequality in the operation of the criminal justice systems worldwide is totally functional to this business as usual. So um, in your book, you use uh, the concept of over and under criminalization. And I was wondering whether you could um, explain it with this uh, COVID example and with the pandemic example. So uh, I think what you are saying is that certain behaviors are under criminalized because they are not um, defined as a crime. For example, I would say that would be um, producing very bad in the flash industry and um, also producing um, or that factories produce in the global south and a lot of people die there. And um, yeah, so I was just wondering whether you can explain how this concept of under and over criminalization acts out today and whether you could give us some examples or explain it with the pandemic example again. Lovely. So I use this, um, this concept to point out that uh, if we think in terms of social harm, this concept that we were saying before, we will see that the criminal response is not proportional to the social harm produced by the different behaviors, but to the demographic 
uh, of the population that commit the crimes and the impact in the socioeconomic system. So if we see like stealing a, a cell phone, that doesn't produce a lot of social harm. We over-criminalize it beyond the harm that is produced and only because the guy that commits the crimes is poor, is marginalized, we don't care about him. We even want to control him through the criminal justice system. And then we have, for example, corporate crime with um, a manipulation of vaccine production in order to make profit. We have a huge social harm emerging from that behavior. People actually dying massively daily on a global scale basis. But because that is produced by corporations, so leading socioeconomic people, and that's functional to the accumulation of, of resources by the by the one percent, then that is under criminalized, regardless the enormous social crime that is harm that is produced. And this we can see it in the pandemic at a, at a, at a terrible basis. Um, for example, with the over criminalization of the people that go into the street breaking one norm of uh, public health, but without, for example, prosecuting Amazon for having the employees in terrible conditions without access to running water, to a proper social distance, even if Amazon is making crazily profit in the context of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we can see this under and over criminalization getting really, really bad in the context of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you also uh, make out different stages and phases of the um, under and over criminalization. Um, could you explain what phases uh, you think there are? Yes. So uh, what I try to point out is that uh, it's not only when the police go into the streets that we have this under and over criminalization, but we have basically two stages. The first one is called primary criminalization. This concept comes from critical criminology from the 1960s and 70s. I added this under and over criminalization. So primary criminalization means that we live in a planet that is not super um, nice and solidarity. We have lots of behaviors that are not super cool, but we don't criminalize everything. So there is a first level that is called primary criminalization in which the parliament decides to criminalize some behaviors and not others. So if I am in, in a bus and I don't give the seat to an old lady, that's something that is not nice. We would like to live in a, in, a, in a world where people like say, okay, old lady, take a seat. But, they, but the legislator doesn't say, okay, this is bad enough in order to criminalize it. It makes, it makes some choices. In these choices, the legislator at the primary criminalization level tends to over criminalize the crimes of the poor. So we have all the time new punishment for uh, asylum seekers that break the law, for immigrants that don't have the necessary papers, for people that break the parole. And then we have an under criminalization of corporate crimes. And for example, the manipulation of vaccines, the increasing of the price of, of some medicaments, all of that is not considered a crime. Then we have the secondary criminalization. That is when these laws that are written in paper are actually enforced in reality. And there we have the police, then we have the judiciary, then we have the prison system, and afterwards we have the administrative system that works with the collateral consequences of punishment. In, and at these four levels, we have the enforcement of secondary criminalization that is again under and over criminal uh, there are behaviors that are under or over criminalized so the police is not even prepared to persecute complex crimes they are prepared to be in the streets and pay attention to car to traffic to violations of of very urban basic norms and they are not prepared to see if like randomly they build up a new building that that is not um, hasn't been built with, with with legal funding. They are not even technically prepared to identify those kind of crimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the same with the judiciary, prison, etc. So we can see that at all these levels, from the creation of the norms to the collateral consequences of crime, we can divide the um, the work, the enforcement, or the work in the functioning of the criminal justice system in under and over criminalization. Yeah, 
Um, there is an interesting uh, question in the chat, which I would like to ask you. Yes. Um, it is, um, how is crime connected to the moral discourse and reveals the reasons why somebody um, commits a crime? Mm. Why is crime connected to the moral discourse and reveals the reasons why somebody do crimes? Okay. Hmm. I don't know if I understood it correctly, mm -hmm. um, but um, there are some more reasons. Indeed, we have a uh, Stanley Cohen, that is one of the greatest critical criminologists, that he talks about moral panics. Yeah. And what he says is that the media, social media, and even the leading politicians tends to describe crime under moral terms. So the people are stealing the, the product of my decent job. When he's when the guy is taking my handy, he's like uh, messing up with all my effort as a law-abiding person. So there is a division between good and bad guys, in which, of course, we are only referring to street uh, criminals, and the crime is described as something that is morally outrageous. Uh, indeed. Stanley Cohen talks about moral panic because it's not only about talking about one criminal in particular, but saying that there is a panic, an emergence of insecurity. We even saw that in the last elections, when Berlin, mm -hmm. when the when the winner described the of the SPD, mm -hmm. made made a main point insecurity in Berlin. Yeah, yeah, that's in a Berlin. huge theme right now in Berlin. Yeah. With with the people saying that the actual problems is clan criminality and it just there are more severe problems though i don't totally. want yeah 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 like we don't have housing we don't have um steles in kitas we don't yeah. have like funding in the hospitals but the problem yeah. is security in berlin like yeah. that yeah i think this is a really good example for moral panics because the way it is shown in uh, German TV shows or YouTube videos and documentaries, they are called. Um, it's really ex exaggerated and yeah, 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 yeah. And it hides which are the real uh, problems, as you were saying, yeah. and, and was yeah. giving some examples. Totally, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, we don't talk about the roots of the crimes anymore, but we just fall into this discourse of of panic yeah yeah um so another question i wanted to ask you is that um on the left i think we are quite aware of the unfairness of the justice system and we we don't think that it's like the most amazing thing and that it can do justice and bring justice to all of us and i remember that i um saw a comparison a few years ago uh, which compared the sentence of Andre Emminger, a guy who helped um, the NSU trio commit murderers with the sentence of some protesters who threw like uh, bottles at the G20 protests in Hamburg. And the sentence were pretty similar. So Andre Emminger for helping to, for helping other people to commit murderer, he got a sentence of two and a half year and uh, the, the persons who threw the bottles, the sentences were not all the same. They, they varied from one and a half year to three years. But in general, I think we can say that they are similar. Um, so I wanted to ask you whether this perceived unfairness is just a recent phenomenon or whether it has always existed in a capitalist society and how far back we can trace this unfairness. So that, but you, that's a really, really, really great example. And you already mentioned in the beginning that I have just published in December this book, Criminalization of Activism. Uh, and that's like very related with your example. And it's something that shows this, the, the power of over-criminalization. Because this guy in the G20, he was not even committing a crime. He was enforcing the right to protest. It's a constitutional right. Okay, like not win the bottle, but <laughs> taking part in the protest is a constitutional yeah, right. Yeah. And regardless, like the, the bottle throwing, many were criminalized and persecuted by the yeah. police, even if that didn't end up in the judiciary. 
So we can see that um, that, uh, that that the criminal justice system is over criminalizing behaviors that can that should even be considered as rights that should be respected and promoted by the state as criminalization. Um, and on the other hand, really severe crimes like as the NSU complex, as you were saying, have been have been gone without any attention of the criminal justice system, despite the fact that grassroots organizations are pushing forward accountability and that it, this involves even state agents. And um, in, indeed, in the context of protests, something that is not even you were asking if this is something new. It's definitely not new. We can trace it, and that's what I do in the book. You can we can trace it to the beginning of the criminal of the capitalist system of production, and uh, particularly we can see this pattern of over criminalization of protest and under criminalization of the uh, repressive response of the state. So we can see from the beginning of of history, of modern history, that every time that the underclass tries to protest. So to, to, to enforce a constitutional right, a basic right, a civil and political right, the response is over criminalization. And when the police responds to this using massive violence, even deadly force, there is no response. And these actions are under criminalized. And this we can see it from Marx from the 17th century, even before to today. We even have like the current um, the current chancellor that he was involved in severe oh. in, in the G20, right? Yeah. yeah. And that who also like, is involved in um in in Comex, I think, in the Comex scandal and in the Wirecard. I'm not quite sure if he is involved in both of them, but definitely one of them. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And he is still a chancellor. Yeah. And he's a chancellor. Like imagine the level of under criminalization that yeah. you can do that and become the chancellor of, of Germany. But if you are there taking part in a protest and you threw a bottle, which you shouldn't do, <laughs> you end up with this uh, with this like crazy prison term. So the, this shows the, the example. If you are there on the repressive side of the protest, you can end up being a chancellor. If you are there in the protest side, you will end up with a prison sentence. Yeah. So um, I was wondering, we talked about under and over criminalization of protests right now, but can we also see it in different uh, behaviors, like historically speaking? And um, also, if we can, um, how is this criminal selectivity uh, linked to the rise of capitalism? And do you think that it was a precondition for the rise and emergence of capitalism? Yeah, so that's what I argue in the book, exactly that. And um, what I point out is that, uh, well, well, Marx, uh, Karl Marx in, in chapter 24 of, of Das Kapital says that we needed a, a primitive accumulation. So like to start as to start any business as capitalism is, we needed a, a primary uh, source of resources. And these resources were obtained through crime. But of course, like we cannot say that capitalism is based on crime. So there we have the first instance of under criminalization. So the, this primitive accumulation and his Marx discusses very, very in, in very detail in, in this chapter 24 that you can check online. Um, is very it has a very friendly yeah. writing style. It's also one of my favorite chapters. <laughs> Yes, and, and it's like we think, oh, no, I will not read Marx, but this is a part that you can read uh, without a lot of, of trouble. And he points out that these uh, this primary source, resources, like what happened was that first slavery in Latin America and in Africa and in some part of Asia. So a, a, a massive crime like slavery and like using all the, the all that workforce for free until their extermination so massive genocide then we have all the land grabbing or of all the small peasants in europe in order to put all that land together and create the, the first a uh, massive agricultural uh, land exploitation we had um al we have a lot well we have of course the oppression of women women that they were the ones that have all the traditional knowledge that was passing from generation to generation, 
We needed to take her out. We needed to control also a reproduction in order to make sure that abortion became illegal, that we could control the reproduction of the working force. So really, if we see which was the origins of, cap of capitalism, piratery, we have like crimes and crimes and crimes and massive crimes, crimes that are like regulated at the International Criminal Court. Uh, and that's how we got the initial money in order to make capitalism possible. And of course, not, not, none of this was framed as crime. Like the, the guy, the Spanish guy that discovered that in America, Cristobal Colón, that he was the one directing this original genocide, is still in museums, in statues, in the names of the avenues. If we go to Bedding, to the neighborhood of Bedding in, in Berlin, we will see the names of the people that were there colonizing Namibia and um, producing a genocide against the African population. So, of course, it's not recognized as a crime, it's under-criminalized, and it's even recognized as a historical uh, battle and, and honorific event. Mm. And also, a lot of time, I think, it's uh, legislated. For example, like the slave trades, there were um, laws which told, like, the uh, Black Code, I think, Code Noir, um, existed in French colonies and it told the colonizers how many whips were okay to give to the slaves. So I think we can also see this over and under criminalization with this because this was violent and um, definitely caused harm, but it still, it, wa it wasn't criminalized at all, but it was said, yeah, it's okay to do it, but just in, in, in uh, certain limits. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, so, so you talked a bit about um, how the first capital or like um, um, emerged, and I was wondering what uh, happened with um, the persons who got expelled um, because of the privatization of the land, um, because of the enclosures of the land. Because I think that that's also very interesting and very important um, with this topic. Yeah, totally. All those people that were like, and, and for all of, and that was the origin of the prison system. All those people that were like um, expropriated from, from their lands, they were sent to warehouses. That is the primitive um, form of the prison. So they were not only like expropriated from their land that like was the basis of their daily survival, but they were also put to work 16, 18 hours in crazy and safe and healthy conditions in order to produce products uh, and give out free labor in the origins of capitalism. Um, and also, I think what is uh, interesting to note, because um, I just thought about, so they were sent to those workhouses to do a, a penalty there. Um, mm -hmm. But what was the actual crime they were charged with? Because I also think that that's very, very important. Yeah. Yes, so it was, um, there were many crimes that were uh, over-criminalized in that moment. One was resistance when these expropriations were taking place. The other one uh, was uh, like asking for, for money on the streets. Mm -hmm. There was a change in the beginning of capitalism that uh, before, during feudalism, it was uh, a good thing to have people asking for money on the streets because then it, that allowed the, the feudal uh, lords to give out money and get uh, a direct access to heaven. But then with capitalism, we find out that all those people were like really like uh, making the, the streets dirty. We needed a lot, we needed more, more space for traffic, uh, like for moving the groceries from one place to the other one. And we particularly needed the workforce. So asking for money on the streets uh, became a crime. Also, not having um, a established uh, an anmeldung <laughs> that is like the rule until today. <laughs> if you didn't have a fixed address, that could also become a crime. Um, another thing that we can also relate to today is Germany. Um, also, like doing art without a regulation, without without a permission in the streets or gambling without the permission in the street also became criminalized. 
Um, so all those, all these crimes related with prop, with with poverty, uh, all those uh, behaviors um, be, uh, related with property became crimes, and they were punished with work in workhouses. Yeah. While of course land expropriation, slavery, and piratery were not considered crimes. Yeah. And I also think that this was a very useful mechanism to force people into wage labor because, uh, like you said, that a lot of those activities which you just explained, they were a mean of uh, earning a living, although probably the people didn't earn a very, very huge amount of money, but still they could survive with doing this stuff. And I think in in criminalizing um, in criminalizing these activities, those people also were for, forced to do wage labor afterwards. So it, it was um, also a tool for um, disciplining the working class, right? Totally. Like the idea was to like to stop having these people that were freelancers <laughs> uh, and like forcing all of them to become uh, employees to sell their workforce in order to ensure survival. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering another thing. So we talked about um, like the laws about uh, what what became criminal and um, do you know how it was enforced and especially so in your book you also have a chapter um, on police medically disciplining the working class and I wanted to ask you whether you could tell us anything about the emergence of the police institution and also because right now we have this huge discussions going on about uh, police violence about especially police violence towards immigrants and I wanted to ask you whether this is a new phenomenon, this focus on a special group of persons, or whether we can also trace this back. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, well, no, no, this focus on like the impoverished, the poor, the others, um, it's something that we can see throughout. And um, they think about not having an almeldum from being from somewhere else. And that being a source of criminalization can be like can give us a, a hint directly to asylum seekers today. And in terms of what you were referring to, police medically criminalization, uh, that's how I, I describe the inequality of the criminal justice system in the 19th century and, and beginning of the 20th century. And how, why I do describe it like this. So when after this uh, primitive accumulation, I described that there is a new period called disciplinary criminal selectivity. And in the beginning of this, we have the, the illuminism. So the illustration, like the new criminal code, the new civil codes, the declaration of the rights of the man and the citizen. So some promises that we will all be equal in front of the law. The bourgeois promise is that we are done with feudalism. Now we are all equal in front of the law. We all have equal rights. This is the promise of the bourgeoisie to contrast with the structural inequality of feudalism. In feudalism, you were born in certain subsets. You didn't have any right. No way that you could enforce any right. The promise of capitalism and the bourgeoisie is that now things have changed. Now we are all equal in front of the law. But of course, in reality, this was never implemented. The poor remained in jail, the rich remained outside even when they committed a lot of crimes. So there, there, we needed an explanation. The bourgeoisie needed an explanation to say why nothing changed. So I promise you equality in front of the law and then you as, a, as, a, as an impoverished person, you can see that things didn't change at all. Indeed, now you are even more exploited than before. And the explanation raised by the bourgeoisie came from this uh, police medically discourse. So from the medical discourse, the idea was like, okay, we want to treat everybody on equal terms, but the problem is that some people are uh, biologically dangerous. So we cannot do anything about it. And then the, that some people are dangerous. I have like a problem with the with the <laughs> artificial intelligence. I, so, <laughs> I wondered so, what it was. 
<laughs> so the so this medical discourse will say uh, even if we want it there are born criminals mm -hmm. and these people have like some different crane structure different bone structure you can see that in their lips in their skin color there is nothing that we can do to treat them equally they are a danger to society we need to enforce some social defense mm -hmm. against these people that are biologically determined right. to yeah. commit crime there, so also they... was this, there also was this one professor who is called Lombroso, right, who went into prisons and uh, looked at the prisoners and he painted pictures of the faces of the prisoners. Yeah. yeah. So if you exactly. want to, you can also look that up in the internet to everybody who's yes. watching the video. He's called Lombroso. Yeah. Exactly. Lombroso was like the, the father of this, thought, of this positivist thought. That will be the basis of euthanasia and like of the basic thoughts of the of the Nazi regime. The fact that that people were untermentioned, that they didn't deserve to live. So they, it's, this is very connected. And um, but going back to Lombroso and to the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, then we see this biological discourse that explains why inequality persists despite the promise of equality. But the doctors will not go to the street to detain these born criminals. We needed also someone that would be there doing the actual dirty war, work. And that was the beginning of the police force. We need to control massive population in the, in the ever-growing cities. And in this regard, it was very important to have a new force that was formally organized under the regulation of the state in order to detain these born criminals and ensure social defense. That's why in this 1920th century, I talk about medical police, medical criminal selectivity. That is like the police was doing the dirty work, why, why the doctors were giving the discourse of um, peligrosity, dangerousness. Mm -hmm. And I also think that here it works quite well to uh, get the people to uh, do wage labor because I think that we also see like the ones who are uh, defined at born, as born criminals are often uh, the proletarian, uh, the working class, all those people. Yeah, exactly. Indeed, uh, Lombroso, uh, Ferri, um, all the, the Italian positivist thinkers put the anarchist as one type of born criminal. Yeah. The socialist also, but particularly the anarchist, was defined as a biological determination to political crime. Mm -hmm. They thought that we were born anarchists and that we needed to stop these people because they were dangerous and they were prone to crime under a biological impulse. Yeah, yeah. crazy. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> When we are talking about like like this saying that anarchists are born criminals, um, I wanted to go back on your other book, on the one on the criminalization of activism, um, because um, there are some contributions in this book which discuss uh, the repression of activism today and especially uh, place them in the neoliberal area, uh, era, sorry. And mm -hmm. um, they, they look at the changes with criminalization of protest in neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what you think about that, whether uh, the criminalization of protest in neoliberalism is becoming uh, very different or whether it is just um, also like not something especially new to history. Yeah. Well, again, I have to say that nothing new. <laughs> it has been there for a long time. And indeed, um, you can also see in the, uh, in the writings of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels that uh, when this anarchist prototype and this communist prototype was um, identified as a born criminal, they started moving from one country to the other one within Europe in order to be in those countries that were like less militarized, less uh, that they had a, um, a, a less severe criminalization in order to keep on 
pursuing the, uh, the organization of the first international communist organization. So indeed, from, from, from Marx times, there was this criminalization of activism, and he suffered that himself. He had to go from one country to the other one because he was like criminalized once and again in each country. So everybody, like even the communist organizations were banned, the right to protest was, was restrained, and even the main leaders like Marx and, and Engels were, were persecuted. So this is something that and we can even trace it like way before to the expropriation of lands that we were saying in the 15th and the 16th century. But I don't say that everything is the same throughout time. Yeah. Each phase has its own characteristics. That's why even though I say inequality and the unfairness in the criminal justice system have always been the rule, it's not enforced in the same way. And in this, um, in this vein, the criminalization of activism, the criminalization of protests today has a certain specificity. First one, social media. Of course, in, Carl, in Mark Carl's time, there was no social media. And this is a great tool for, for criminalization. Someone can check this video and say that I am accusing the chancellor of being a criminal. <laughs> Who <laughs> actually is a criminal, I guess. <laughs> So social media and uh, streaming can allow for further criminalization. Yeah. <laughs> um, and even if there is an, an author, um, Bernard Harcourt, that he's from, from the United States, that he showed how a uh, police in the United States traced the Black Lives Matter movement, just checking the events on Facebook and the list of attendees. That easy. Yeah. And then you can trace each of these people and see if they are involved in, in other um, demonstrations, if they are considered at risk for public safety, and use like online tools in one second to know everything about them. So social media is a particularity of the criminalization of, of activism today. In the book that you were mentioning, um, there is one chapter by Mark Colin that he's a, um, a great Marxist a scholar on artificial intelligence in order to over-criminalize activism, the use of artificial intelligence. And a, another important characteristic of the criminalization of activism today is militarization. So the confusion between police and military. Under this a labeling of terrorism, the states are increasingly using exceptional laws, so laws that are uh, that are devoted for situations of emergency, situations of a, for an external attack, for a war, in order to control ordinary protests by civilians yeah. and labeling them as terrorists as enemies. So those are two two features of today's criminalization of activism. Yeah, I also heard a podcast today where they talked about that. Uh, Breton, I think it was uh, the mayor of New York, I don't know, but uh, he was also involved in uh, developing the broken windows theory or broken window theory policing. And um, he decided that the uniforms of the police officers should be black and should be uh, that the police officers shouldn't look like the nice guy from the streets who is helping everybody, but that they should look like military also. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Chulani and the broken windows. And imagine, like we were talking about over criminalization. His example to develop this um, this idea is someone that breaks a window on a car of a car, under yeah. the idea that if some, that if someone breaks a window of a car, then another one will break another window, another one will steal the radio, and then all the neighborhood will suddenly become a chaos and like a source of massive crime yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh just maybe for the listeners this is basically what the broken window theory is saying that if one window is broken in the neighborhood every like other windows will get broken as well and then like in a few weeks crime will be everywhere um yeah and i think that uh from from this uh theory there also follows a certain um a certain uh, mode of policing, which is 
um, which is called zero tolerance policing. And it, um, it, um, if somebody is committing like a very, very low offense crime, like, I don't know, also if somebody is begging, but that's also met with zero tolerance. So I think with this new model of policing, we can also see um, how it is still uh, criminalizing um, the poor and the homelessness, for example. Yeah, exactly. And another piece of, of law uh, linked to, to zero tolerance is one that is called three strikes and you are out. That was um, that started in California that they use this uh, baseball uh, metaphor to say that if you commit three crimes, regardless which crimes are they, you have a uh, 25 years to life imprisonment. So there are cases, there, there is one really crazy case of someone that stole three times socks from um, H&M or one of these a huge brands and he got 25 years. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter which is the severity of the crime. It matters that you don't break the window, that you don't start this uh, escalating uh, ladder towards chaos. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, in your book about the criminalization of protests, there are also um, contributions to the criminalization of uh, protests in the global south and of uh, on the differences between the criminalization in the global south and in the global north. And I was wondering whether you could explain a little bit about that to us. Yeah. Yes. I even have a question for you about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm excited. <laughs> because one, one main difference between the Global South and the Global North is like the massive character of protest. Maybe the US is a middle ground, but if you see the protests in Europe in comparison with the protests in, in the South, it's crazy. So in, in, in Berlin, we can see small protests in Hermannplatz, in, in Mitte, but very isolated. Like the last protest here in Argentina, for example, it has 800,000 participants two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So the protests are really massive. But I am still striking with like one question that is that the, the biggest uh, demo that I saw in, in Berlin was for the murder of George Floyd in the US. Yeah. yeah. I have Although there are a lot of uh people who who were murdered by the german police yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. well we don't have that kind of demonstration for the nsu complex impunity mm -hmm. why we didn't have any kind of big demonstrations against right-wing extremism in the police even though we saw the whatsapp groups we saw we had the, the data yeah. like i i don't know if it's the international community that attended that demo uh, for the george floyd killing that might I be. don't think so. I, I think that it was just because also if if we look at the discourse on police violence in Germany, I think we noticed that we copy a lot of the stuff from the US context, but uh, we don't apply it to the German context, although like the situation is quite different because, for example, we didn't have slavery in Germany, but we have a lot of um, labor migration. So I think this this uh, phenomenon that we look to the U.S. for protest and that we get like really outraged that somebody was killed there, but we don't see it here. It's it's yeah quite common. Yeah, but still there were some demonstrations um, against like also um, um, after the attentat in Hanau. But um, I also know that some of my friends who are not. Uh, very political. A lot of them came to the demonstration um, um, because of the murder of George Floyd with me, but they didn't come to the demonstration uh, because of the Hanau attentat. Yeah. Can you do a, a, some field work and ask them why did they go to one another? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or just drag them to the demonstration the next time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the other difference, so one is like the quantity, uh, so the, the number of participants, that's a great difference between the South and the North, because in like in imagine in Germany, the last super big demonstration was in the case of the G20, where we had people from all over Europe and maybe from all over the place, from all over the world. 
So that's a huge difference that, of course, has an impact in the way in which protests are, are being handled. But then there is another chapter in this book, Criminalization of Activism, that was written by Gabriela Guzis from Argentina. And she suggested, she suggests that we need another concept. And she coins this notion of repressivization. And this is when the police you don't doesn't, don't doesn't go like to try to 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 detain and enforce the law but directly use deadly force yeah. and that's something that we see permanently in latin america almost on a daily basis you can go to a demonstration and you can get you can be killed by police you also see it in the united states particularly if you are black but we don't see that at a at a general scale in, in Europe or in the global north. So that's that's something really massive, a massive difference. So you can get not only over criminalized, but you can get killed if you protest in the South or, or in the US. But that's something that fortunately we, we don't experience on a daily basis in, in Europe. Yeah. I think that's also quite connected to colonialism, right? Because um, uh, I remember that somebody uh, I, I don't know who, but said like that in Europe, consent is made through uh, hegemony, like through violence and ideology, but that in the colonies, it was mainly through violence. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Gramsci tools. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are actually all the questions I had right now I prepared for you. And I, I looked at the questions in the in the chat, but I didn't find any. Also, I have to say, as it is my first time, I was a bit uh, confused with every, everything. So if I didn't um, read your questions, I'm sorry, I'm improving. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for being here, for being with us and for talking to us about uh crime and capitalism yeah thank you, thank you. Thank you that was me. it bye 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 Wir brauchen eure Hilfe und zwar als allererstes. Folgt uns bitte überall, wo ihr uns folgen könnt. Wir sind auf YouTube, auf Facebook, auf Twitter. Wir sind jetzt mittlerweile auch auf Twitch. Gebt uns Instagram. Dort, äh, Instagram sowieso, genau. Gebt uns dort einen Follow. Äh, liked dieses Video bitte. Überhaupt jedes Video, das ihr euch anschaut, bitte liken. Warum nicht? Ist doch einfach nur ein Klick da. Damit helft ihr uns ungemein. Wenn ihr uns abonniert auf YouTube, klickt auch die Glocke. Dann werdet ihr immer informiert, wenn wir live gehen. Dann könnt ihr dazukommen. Äh, je mehr Leute live mit uns unterwegs sind, desto äh, besser sind dann auch die Views und desto besser ist das für den Algorithmus. Wir haben außerdem ein Patreon-Konto. Genau. Patreon.com slash 99 zu 1. Wenn ihr so richtig dabei sein wollt, äh, könnt ihr euch ein Membership-Level aussuchen. Wir haben drei verschiedene Stufen. Es gibt dann solche Sachen wie zum Beispiel diese neuen Nachspielepisoden, wo wir jetzt die erste gemacht haben. Und äh, ihr habt auch Zugang zu unserer Discord-Community. Weiters haben wir einen paypal.me slash 99 zu 1 Link, falls ihr denkt, naja, sind schon schnaffte Typen, aber mehr als einmal will ich nicht zahlen, dann könnt ihr uns da auch ein bisschen Geld schicken. Wir haben tatsächlich inzwischen relativ signifikante laufende Kosten, weil wir einen hohen Qualitätsanspruch haben. Insofern, wir sind wirklich auf eure Unterstützung angewiesen an der Stelle. 